Okay, let's get started. Here I am on my new Windows device with Windows 8 running on it, and I have my lock screen across the front. So when I resume wind from sleep, I go right to my lock screen where it shows me all the at-a-glance information that I might want to know about, things that have been happening while I was away. It says that I'm supposed to be doing a demo, good thing. I have all my email messages, it's a light day, and all the things that uh, battery, internet connection, other things I might want to see. When I'm ready to start using Windows, I just swipe up with my finger and I go to my new login screen. This is called Picture, Picture Password. And very easily, I'm going to press on my daughter's nose, press on the lemonade, and draw a line. And very quickly, in, in, on my mobile device, I logged in. <laughs> And now you all know my password, but luckily it's easy to change. <laughs> Before I get going any further, I want to show you a couple things that will help you follow me in the demo. We turned on touch points in the demo, so when I press on the screen, you're going to see my finger in a little circle there. And that's just turned on so you can follow me without an over-the-camera shoulder. So let's take a look at the start screen. The start screen is Windows. This is the place you come to when you start Windows, and it's the place you go to get to all the applications that you guys are going to build that people are going to love. All the applications that I have on here today are just samples that we've written to showcase the platform, not announcing any new utilities or, or any new features in Windows. They're simply written to show off what the platform is capable of doing. So I'm going to go through here, and I'm just going to swipe to the right and take a look at all the programs by sliding to the left. And let's look at what these tiles are all about. Each one of these tiles represents an application. I have a tile from my Windows Live Mail up here telling me that Matt Berg has just sent me a message. I have my calendar. I have my news reader on my current feed. I have paused music. As I scroll down, you see the other applications. Some of them probably look familiar to you. <coughs> Task manager. <coughs> Too much practicing. Task manager, notepad, the pinned people and people that I want to interact with. I have a bunch of games. And all, everything that's on here is personal to me. And it's only the things that I want on my screen. And it's very easy for me to go ahead and customize and rearrange and make it look exactly like I want. So th this start screen, is, it's not just a launcher for programs. The start screen represents a, a unification and integration of program launching, switching between running programs, and also notifications and gadgets are all integrated into one start screen. So you have to look all over the place. You guys don't have to write code all over the place to, to integrate with Windows. One place makes it really super convenient, and it's highly customizable. Right. And so here I am with my, uh, I'm not in Redmond today, so I'm going to go ahead and take this off the screen. I'm going to drag out. Uh, it doesn't go into a mode or anything. I can just automatically drag around to where I want it to go. I can even use two hands to arrange it. I dropped it. We'll go back in. I can easily just drag around and rearrange. Go ahead and select it to the end and drop it here. Pick this one up. But you saw how I'm kind of scrolling in a long list. If I want to get faster access to all the places in, in my program list, instead of scrolling along many, many pages, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and pinch with my finger. So watch closely. I'm going to go like this, and it's going to zoom me out to see the entire set of the things that I have on my system. So I can very easily get to new places, get to the, uh, the games group. I can rearrange these as well. So I just drag it out, just like I did with the other ones. I can position things in a new place, which makes it super easy for me to go and uh, rearrange and get access to the things I really care about. So I have one group in here. I can name these groups and order these groups. This one's a, a games group. I just swipe down and selects the group, and I can name the group using the on-screen keyboard. I'll go in here and click Games. Save that. And now I have games. And then to go back, you just do the same gesture on the way out as I just pinch and go out. So it makes it very easy for me to customize and rearrange and get exactly what I want on the screen exactly the way I want it. I can also customize the look of my start screen and my user tile. And that's pretty easy to do too. So I'm going to click here, press here. Go to my new user tile, and we have a built-in webcam with Windows, and this computer has both a front 
facing and back facing. And unfortunately, to get a new picture, I have seen what I look like on these webcams. <laughs> not doing that. So I brought Mort, and he's going to be my, my picture for today. Whoa, I need to get out of there. I click there. That was good. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and decide that that's what I want. Select it and change my user tile. And now if I go to the lock screen, all the pictures and things I have on my system, I just click and change my lock screen. So I showed you a little bit about how to personalize Windows. All with a touch-centric control panel as well. And personalized Windows, and uh, now let's launch some of those Metro-style applications that you guys are going to be building. Take more from me. So I'm going to go down the end here and launch a game. This game is actually really fun to play. Um, it's a touch-first, full-screen, immersive application. And as I drag across, I'm going to start to play it. And it's, it does three-letter words, so that makes it easy. Uh, and I don't mess up that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see another one. And, and I can continue launching by going back to the start screen. I'm swiping my thumb from the right-hand side of the screen and bringing up start. I'm going to launch my newsreader application, which is another Metro-style application. Now, these applications, their user interface for these applications you get by swiping up from the bottom. And here I can add the new feeds. I can refresh, remove, or whatever capabilities your app wants to have. They come from what we call the app bar. When I click into this headline here, it's going to give me a newspaper-like layout for me to be able to read my blog. And really fast and fluidly, I can swipe through and read my articles. I'm going to go back to start, again, swiping from the right, and launch a popular social networking app using OpenAPIs. Uh, we created a sample application here. I'm going to go into my news group and check out my news feeds. And then we'll launch a little video. And I know this video has soundtrack, so again, I'm going to swipe from the right-hand side of the screen and bring up the settings. In context of playing the video, I have access to all my system settings that I might want to do while I'm working with apps. Here I have the sound muted. And above this, I also have the settings for the application itself. So the applications share the settings space with the system settings to make it easier for people to not have to go out of context of what they're trying to get done just to change the volume or access something about your settings of your app. So here we are back in my video and to switch between these applications I just go ahead and swipe out from the left hand side of the screen. It was fast and fluid to get back to where I was. If I want to view two things on the screen I can dock one to the right and then, or to the left, and then continue swiping. It is pre-release software. <laughs> we'll dock it this way. Or not. There we go. And so I can easily do two things at one time. So I can add to my news feed while I'm watching my movie, play my game while I'm watching my movie, uh, or doing my homework, or... Well, of course, Windows is multitasking from the, the kernel on up, and so all we're showing here is the fact that two applications can always be running in, in Windows. And this ability to dock them is, is a really cool ap opportunity for you to sort of create like a heads-up view of your application. And so every application has both that docking view and the side view. Now I'm going to launch an uh, application that we are shipping with Windows 8. Uh, it's Internet Explorer it, for Metro style, and it has here a, loaded a web page for me. And you can see how fast and fluid the browser is, and how easy it is for me to pan and, and zoom around in this application. This is all built on top of the Internet Explorer that you see today, Internet Explorer 9, all hardware accelerated, and makes it super fast and easy for me to get around in my web pages. It's also um, completely Chromeless, if you notice, and I don't think anything is better than an entirely Chrome-free <laughs> browsing experience. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> oh, I get it. I know what I just said. Oh. <laughs> He's so funny. <laughs> 
Uh, so swiping up from the bottom, I bring up the, the app bar again, the user interface uh, elements for Internet Explorer, and I can do all the things you'd expect to be able to do in the browser. I can turn on in private, do in private browsing. I can create new tabs, go to my pinned apps, launch a pinned website. Or do that later. Or not. <laughs> I can also just easily uh, type into the browser, I can back in there, go back to here, and type in my URL using the on-screen keyboard. Let's see, I'm going to go to uh, Whole Foods, or not, or not, let's skip over to this other machine. Explorer, I'm swiping, I'm zooming, I bring up the UI, and we're going to add a pen. There we go. <laughs> and I'm going to go back and type in my URL, go to this Whole Foods page, and I can pan and zoom around and do all the things that you're used to doing in the browser. So let's go ahead and do a couple new things. I'm going to go ahead and select this text here by just selecting it and dragging. And it's, it's always something that you want to do to, when you're on a web page. You often want to send a snippet of some content around to someone or send a, a link or a URL. You end up having to leave your application, launch another application, find the person you want to send it to, and copy and paste in the content or copy in the links. With Windows 8, it's possible for applications to interact with each other much more directly and help the customer or the user stay in the context of the application that they're doing to complete their task. And we think this will add up. Uh, create a whole new set of scenarios for you to create with your application. So I'm going to use something uh, out the right hand side. We call these things out here on the right charms. And the charms are the way that, you, that the applications can power the system and add new capabilities to Windows. So I'm going to click the share charm. And when I do that, I see all the applications that I support the share contract, which you'll learn a lot more about in Antoine's presentation in a little bit. It also has a kind of an MRU list. I'm going to launch an application called FriendSend, which is a sample application that we wrote. And you see that the content that I copied from Internet Explorer shows up inside uh, this application. This application can show the kinds of capabilities it has to do with the content coming from Internet Explorer. You, you can kind of think of sharing as a very semantically rich uh, clipboard almost that make, when all of your applications can share with each other, even with applications that they didn't know about when you wrote your application. So you don't have to try to figure out how to get connected to everywhere else. We'll help you do that through the, the sharing what we call contracts. And as, as I'm typing here, you're seeing uh, autocomplete and spell checking. That's also something that's Wait, systemized. Just spell checking, spell checking throughout out the whole system. <laughs> I, I, I was going to be pissed if they didn't applaud for that one. <laughs> I don't think you, you cook, so I'm going to choose somebody else here. Uh, let's see. We have my friend Alice. And I'll share that. And so without, now I can get right back to browsing without having to come back to it and find where I left off. Bring out the charms again and go back and show you a couple other ways that applications can power the system using search. Go into search and here you see search pretty much like you would expect in Windows 7. I can search my applications, my settings, my files. And this is what's you'd expect to see, and pretty much what everyone does today, which is search your local hard drive or search the entire universe uh, over the internet. My, my Bing application here will do, go ahead and search the entire internet for me. But with Windows 8, applications can make their content available for people to search directly. So while in context of looking for something, it's very easy for an end user to go through and find and filter the content based on the applications that you've created. So here I have my music app. I'm going to search for Viper Creek. I think you guys are going to see Viper Creek on Wednesday. I can just go ahead and launch my music from here. Start playing the music, I think. Sound. And if I still want to see what's going on with Viper Creek in some other context now, I go back 
to search, and I can search so, for tweets or any other application that has no knowledge about Viper Creek and quickly search through and see what's happening there. So the applications are really powering the system with new capabilities. And as you get more and more applications, the system gets richer and richer. So here I am in my social networking app. I'll show you one more way that applications can add power and support and show their content for people to interact with on Windows 8. So here's a going to do a little tweet about the concert that I just went to when I went and saw Viper Creek Club. So it was a cool concert. Look at that autocomplete there. Huh? I typed concert on this machine before. And I also want to add a picture. So I press the little picture button and it took me right to my hard drive and my, doc and my pictures folder and all the pictures that I have on my hard disk are right here. And I see that I have one. But often I have pictures in other places that I have access to. I have access to them um, on friends, uh, social networking sites, on my own social networking sites. And those social networking sites can add the capability to share content from them right into the file picker. So I'm going to choose one that we wrote called Photo Feeder that has some pictures from my friend Sarah. And I go ahead and select her picture. And so I can have pictures come from a variety of things. I don't have to copy them to the hard drive to be able to access and use them. They can stay stored in the cloud in the, inside your application and then be accessed and used without having to copy them to the hard drive. So I'm going to go ahead and import these. Feel free. <laughs> amazing light. This one looks good, so I'm going to go ahead and click here, and I'm going to tweak that. And there you go. My tweet is live. I'm going to go back to start. And that was really a super quick overview of some of the new things about the bold new Metro style interface for Windows 8. I showed you how launching and switching uh, applications and getting notifications is super fast and fluid. I showed you how applications can be side by side, how applications power the system with new capabilities and new functionality, how apps can talk to other apps, how apps can talk to the cloud, and this works across all of your Windows devices. It, actually, here's a, another machine that Julie is logged into, and it's a pretty cool machine too. Don't watch me. Oh, how are we doing there? Oh, there we go. So you know, I can pan around, look at six to your finger, just like you would expect. I can scroll all the way over here. I can launch the Bing app that I can't see. No, don't. What? Is it? Skip it. Okay. And then uh, check this out. Well, I can't see. And then uh, if you look here, uh, you can actually see that there's more the picture uh, that Julie took before, and it synced all the way over here. And there's a, I could go and change user tile, and you can see the big picture of Mort that Julie just took, and it here. synced its settings over here. And we'll talk a lot about that soon. But oh, and uh, what kind of machine is this one? Uh, this is an ARM-based machine. So. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, Julie. That's just a quick look at the user experience of Windows 8 runtime. Works across all the languages as well. It, it, it does. There is another sensor I want to talk about, which is the Near Field Communication Sensor, or NFC. So Julie showed you um, sharing between two applications and how powerful that is. We're, we have tap to share scenarios between two PCs too, and it's based on an antenna. In this case, it's in the back of this PC. I can take this tagged card that goes to the build website. I put it here. I can touch the notification. Did that show up okay? Yep. And then you can go right to the build website. So whether it's interacting with objects or interacting across PCs, NFC is also exposed. And there are some sessions that show you how to take advantage right, of that. That card had an antenna in it, and it, it is the NFC card. There are a lot of other devices, too, that require software to really complete the experience. Today, whether it's a sensor that's inside the PC or an external peripheral, like a, a printer or webcam, you have to like write a lot of software. And it's not always software that you want to write. It's got to have its own installer, its own updater. And most importantly, it has to find a way to go in sync with the Windows UI. They're trying to replace it or kind of run alongside yeah, these, it. These are these, these applets that come on a system, and there's like a control panel, there's a notification tray, there's things in the start <laughs> menu, things on the desktop. 
all just to get your device to work. And so we've really worked hard with the ecosystem to improve that situation. Right, we want to make those apps metro style apps. We want the, we want the functionality, right. but we want customers to be able to have unified notifications, easier distribution for you, and full access to the underlying system, including integration into the UI. So I'll show you the first example. This is a Microsoft webcam, one of our HD webcams, and all of our HD webcams are going to ship with these new device apps. So you saw Julie before change her user tile, go into the webcam app. Now you can see oh a little di this is a little difference between Mike and Julie here. So Not flatter than light. <laughs> um, but I, because I have a device app, I can go here to where it says more options, and I can see all of these special effects that come included. <laughs> it's tracking my head around. <laughs> and then there's my user tile. Now, the thing that was cool there is that it was right in the UI, right where you expected it to be. You have to go to a second place. You didn't have to find it. Smoothly integrated, and it's a Metro app, so you get all the rest of the benefits of that platform. Another example is this um, a printing app. So I have a simple app here that will print out a paper airplane that we wrote just to show this. I go to devices. And when I go to print to this HP printer, they created a device app. So I get the standard print experience. I go here to more settings. And finally, you can get all of the control of your printer right from within print. You don't have to go to a special place. You don't have to go anywhere else. And, and there's an opportunity here. There is. The opportunity, if you go into their full, uh, their full version of that app, you can see your ink cartridge is low. Here's where you can buy more ink. Here's where HP, as, as a partner, can show off their own cloud printing services. So the full opportunity is there. It's just done with as much work as Antoine showed to write one of these apps. Um, one of the places where these device apps are, becomes really, really helpful is with uh, connectivity. Yeah. So if you have a 3G PC today, you probably have a second connection manager that you have to manage, and passwords in two places, and the bars don't even match. Like, yeah, you know. uh, so now you can create a Metro-style app to do um, device connectivity. So this PC that I've shown you is on AT&T's uh, 3G network. So it has a built-in 3G card it does. that is connected up right now to AT&T. At the very top, you can see it says connected. I'll try not to have it glare. When I touch it, I can get some information that auto-populates, five megabytes in the last day. View my account, there's a link right above it, and turning sideways. And what that does is it launches that full AT&T app. And so that app shows me all of my data, it shows me all my personal info, and I can go manage my account. But check this out, the same exact PC I have here with a European SIM in it. So this is a, a Vodafone account, but of course Vodafone is European. So here it shows AT&T but would be roaming. Now I don't want to connect on a roaming network just to do things like see my account balance or top up my minutes. But I can go to view my account. Because we've worked a, a lot, so because that sticker shock is really a bad, oh, bad yeah, deal. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want that surprise. So here is the uh, Vodafone account where I can click top up and I can go get more minutes. And what's really cool here is all of that communication was done using a network protocol called USSD. So it's a sideband frequency that does all of that connection without making an IP data connection. So that didn't roam and I could buy minutes and do all of that all from within the app. Awesome. And within all the win Windows runtime, we've done a bunch of work so that you could roam to Wi-Fi, Internet cafes, all seamlessly. So there's a lot of work built into that connectivity, which is abstracted out for your, for your developers. Yeah, it's abstracted out for developers, and it's one of the places where developers working together with hardware partners can really differentiate their experiences right in line. Another place where our partners are doing some really cool differentiation is on new PC form factors. So I've got three PCs here. The, these are all Windows 7 PCs. They've been announced. You can't get them yet. They're shipping soon. Intel calls these Ultrabooks. And the reason they do that is because these are PCs with a full core power processor in a super thin and light package. So each one of these things is, is really amazing. It, it, here's an example. This one will resume from sleep in a, as fast as you can open the lid. This one that Steven's holding, like, go ahead. I, this is really a, a, a sharp PC. This one that Steven has is all aluminum. We showed this one for the first time in the Microsoft uh, keynote at Computex. It's brushed on the bottom. You can get like, these are it's like so thin. They are, they're thin. These are good PCs. Here's another one that's uh, pretty extraordinary. This is a Toshiba. This one is made out of a magnesium alloy honeycomb space frame inside. <laughs> Wait, say that again. It's engineering for cool. Okay. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a super light, it's super stiff, it has no flex to it. When I close this PC, feel this. This is under awesome. two and a half pounds. It's like, it, it's like nothing. Yeah, it's absolutely it's super rigid. rigid. Actually, this is super cool. This is one of the folks at Toshiba did. It's actually thicker, than, thinner than the RGB and RJ45 yeah. connectors. Yeah, level up. It's act, they actually have to bump out. It's thinner than like, legacy connectors. 
This is amazing. The reason PCs can get that thin and that good is because of the new levels of like integration that are going on at the motherboard level. So I'll take one of these Samsung PCs you've seen so many times, open it up, which I opened before, take out the battery, but what you'll see is that the battery is actually bigger than the computer. These things are now mostly battery. On this one simple card, I have a full power PC that's a Core i5, 4 gigs, big solid state disk, integrated 3G wireless WAN, all of the sensors, and something that's like the size of a couple of playing cards. And that's what you would see if you opened up these PCs. They're now just mostly batteries. One tiny integrated motherboard, and you have the entire Windows PC. <laughs> Well, we are just, the, the work that our OEMs are doing is just incredibly cool. I mean, in all of these different form factors, and all of these are going to be great Windows 8 machines. And that's one of the most important things about what we're doing in terms of being able to support the broadest range of types of scenarios and form factors for computing. It's both because of the investments that our OEM partners are making and because of closer cooperation with us. So, of course, you've seen this. I don't know if you guys like it. I'm hoping to get one. This is a quiet the room movement all day. Um, this is a PC that we made together with Samsung. Uh, they invited us into their factories. We started with the, the Shipping Series 7 design, and we did a bunch of work together. We worked with a partner called Atmel, who works on the touch controller and the display kind of integration. We worked with AT&T and Option to do the 3G module. We, we worked with um, ST Micro to do the sensor fusion package. We worked with a lot of partners here. And as a result, we've got BIOS that posts in three seconds. It's worked from AMI, a super thin power adapter. And this PC has been really useful to us internally as we've been developing Windows 8. Wow, how many of them did they make? Well, I was told it's not polite if you don't bring it up to share. So I got 5,000 in a warehouse next wow. week. Wow! range ARM processors, 600 processor servers with four terabytes of RAM. Go ahead and fire this one up. Yeah, uh, Airport X-Ray gave me a hard time with this one. Yeah. This is an enthusiast system that's built with AMI firmware. It's kind of an extreme system. But the last time I did a boot demo was when we launched Windows 7. We had an Acer that booted in 15... Oh, oh it's, <laughs> see, it's almost faster than the monitor can turn on. That's UEFI fast boot. That was a full cold boot. That was a high grenade. That was an anything. It, it actually... Most of the time, we're just the fans spinning up on this I thing. It can start faster than the fans sometimes. It, and it's not just reserved, like UEFI performance isn't just for big, crazy, powerful systems. This is the PC that um, you blogged about in the boot performance blog. And, you know, when you see it start up, you see that you don't have, like, BIOS screens flashing, like, DOS characters and stuff. Eight seconds. This is an in-market shipping today PC. This, this is... A Windows 7 PC. It's a Windows 7 PC in market today, but UEFI is really important because it's not just about speed and having a boot that looks better, it's about security too. So I'm going to boot this PC, except I'm going to do it from this uh, infected USB key. This has got a rootkit virus on it, which is a really nasty piece of malware because you boot from it and your machine would be owned before any software-based security could possibly keep up, but not with UEFI. I'm going to put it in here. Say boot from USB. And you can see it booting. Probably see it flashing. Boom. Boom. That's it. Invalid signature. And so what happened was UEFI checked the boot volume. It had been compromised. And now I'm going to turn this off and turn it back on, and it'll be right back to normal. This is just one of the security features that we have in the product. Yeah, there actually, there's tons of security features. Like, if this machine also had been using BitLocker, then you can't even rip the drive out and use it in other places. So a full range of security software. In fact, one of the things that we've got in Windows 8 is we've taken Defender and we've actually built a, a whole new range of protection all the way up through um, anti-malware, antivirus. All of that is built into Defender should you want to choose to use it or you could use your own security software. But when I showed you that working set earlier, that 281 meg, antivirus is running in there as well. And this is actually an encrypted drive while it's running. So the security is everywhere. So, it's good stuff because all Windows 8 PCs will be faster and more secure as a result. And there's a whole new class of Windows 8 PCs that are going to come into existence based on the new advancements in SOC hardware.
Um, yeah, and so like the job of OS is really uh, to you know attract all different effort, abstract out all the hardware for you so that you can take advantage of, of all the unique hardware. And as I said earlier, what we really want to do is make sure that the unique value of each hardware also shines through in Windows, whether it's graphics cards or system on a chip or or any of the hardware. And so we've got some cool demos of some ARM hardware here. The ARM and SOC hardware combined. This is a Qualcomm ARM reference design. This is the one we showed at Computex. It's an 8660 Snapdragon. It's hooked up to this debugging system here that's measuring power really accurately. And what's going on on this monitor is you can actually see the amount of power being used. It's very low. The system's not off. It's in a new power state called connected standby, which is a really low power idle state. You can see these little spikes that show up here. What's going on is Windows is coalescing all of the timer requests and all of the network requests, turning the radio on briefly, updating the apps, and then shutting the radio back down. So when I turn the system on, it turns on with one click, well, or two, <laughs> depending on if you have demo gremlins. The system's on, you can see the power jumps right up. It's an instant on type scenario because it was never off. I can interact with the system here, and you can see the power kind of changes as we're rendering and we're drawing on the screen. And then when I go to turn it off, I click it, immediately the power drops down. What's going on right there is the apps get a chance to pack up their data, and then it's shutting down, and then it immediately drops back to idle. That's, that's the kind of system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, When we talk about fundamental performance, that's what we're, we're talking about. We're actually taking the things that you experience like in phones and we're bringing that to the, the PC architecture at the base kernel level. And it's one of the things that all of these SOC systems will be able to do. If you go to the um, Understanding Connected Standby session, you'll see the same power demo running on the NVIDIA, Te NVIDIA Tegra 3. Um, we showed, like, it was nine months ago at CEF, so it was the first time we showed ARM booting at all. And all it could do is, like, just boot Windows 8 up to the desktop and, like, one touch. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was just like a motherboard demo. We've made a lot of progress since then. We've got everything running here. We've got fast graphics, the kinds of apps that Julia was running. They're all the exact same apps. I can go back to the beginning. I can launch another so app. So sticks to your finger touch running on, on this prototype hardware. Yeah, it's, it's fast. It's performant. They're the same build. The same build of those apps running here. The same build of those apps running on this TI system. This is an uh, OMAP system, a 4430. And for the first time, no one's, ever, no one's seen this one yet. This is an Intel system. This is an Intel 32 nanometer Atom-based SOC development vehicle. I don't know if they're working on the name yet, but they're working on the power. Yeah. I mean, it's so cool. Our partnership with Intel is great. And we're really excited to be able to show you that, that the progress that they're making on all of this kind of low power work as well from SOC to high power systems. I have a couple high power systems here too. So that performance thing is at both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Tiny systems and enthusiast systems. So this is an HP enthusiast system. It's called the Phoenix. It's gonna be announced later this week, the, the full specs. Obviously it's just announced now. <laughs> um, but what I've got here is a USB 2.0.3.0 demo. So this has two drives inside of it. The one on top that I have open is USB 2 and the one on the bottom is USB 3. Now I'm gonna copy a one gigabyte, I'm gonna select and copy, sorry, I've got to stay out of the way of the camera, a one gigabyte file here, and you can see the new progress indicator. And while that's copying, I'm gonna grab a one gigabyte file for my USB 3 drive, and so how much faster USB 3 copies. So that's like, and we built this in. This is built in with a, a class driver, so you don't have to worry about finding all the drivers. We've done a lot of work to make sure that this works everywhere. It does, and it works on all kinds of systems. I mean, this is a three terabyte drive that I put into that system. Windows 7, you could boot from up to a two terabyte drive. Windows 8, you can boot from a 256 terabyte drive. <laughs> it's, like, it's like science fiction or something. Yeah, I got one of those in the back. Well, you know, the, the reason that that's actually important is because while this drive seems enormous, it cost me less than 150 bucks to buy and drop into that system. So these things are going to be coming soon. Another system that's a little bit extreme is my <laughs> DX11 graphics system. I love this thing. This is great. This is like ice over here. I, I, well, it's not like ice. It's like <laughs> lava, actually, on top. Because what I have is I have three NVIDIA GTX 580s, DX11 graphics card, three. They're linked together, they're running in SLI mode, hooked up to all the water cooling. But what this system is capable of doing on DX11 is turning about 700 watts of electricity into about 4.7 teraflops of computing power. How, how many, 
Teraflops is that. So it's like a wood chunk chunk. Yeah. Uh, if you remember that giant Cray supercomputer, the, like the XPM or something? Yeah, like, like with the big tower and the, the nitrogen. nitrogen yeah. and stuff. It would take 2,500 of those supercomputers to do the same amount of processing you can offload to those graphics cards. <laughs> it's, well, it's actually... And it's, it's just Windows. It's just Windows running on. But this is, that sounds crazy, but it's actually useful. With the direct compute API, you can offload any kind of massively parallel calculation, <laughs> scientific calculation, modeling, all to that. And Research awesome. labs are filled with machines like this. Sure, and dorm rooms, because they're also awesome for <laughs> the most unbelievably realistic and violent games you've ever seen. This is a technology demo here. This is um, a technology demo from Epic. It's using the Unreal Game Engine, which is all DX11 powered, and this camera doesn't do it justice at all. If you get up really close to that screen, you can not only see incredible levels of detail in it, the physics are all rendered in real time, and the whole rest of the world that's off camera is shown in a reflection in his eyes. It's like smoke. The thing is unbelievable. It really is. It really is amazing. You can see the wireframe for the tessellation. You can, you can really understand the power of the graphics. But what's really important with Windows 8 is because DX hardware is so prevalent in the entire ecosystem, we built all of Windows 8 on a hardware accelerated graphics platform. So the reason that the UI is fast across this whole line is that everything has hardware accelerated graphics, including the apps. So you write a Metro style app, it's got graphics. Right, all the transitions, all the graphics, all hardware accelerated, yeah. which we started in IE9. Yeah. And really baking that into the platform at the, at the native code. They, I think they like that. Sounds good. Hardware accelerated graphics, no extra work, just write the app, and it runs from, from ARM all the way up to a system like this. Now, there's another place that um, we are... Uh, working with the um, ecosystems around displays. So one of the things you might notice across all of these displays is that they've got touch and they're widescreen. So first let's talk about um, touch for a second. When we were at Computex, I did this demo where I showed first pixel sensitivity. You know, you've seen this on all-in-ones, you've seen this on tablets, that's how the Windows UI comes up. Because what we wanted to do is get to the point where Windows only had to reserve one pixel around the boundaries to activate all of the UI. And so that left more area here for the apps to take control. So I wasn't quite clear. You don't get every single pixel. You, we do reserve one pixel yeah, on the whole. Off, off by one. Off by one. Typical developer. Typical developer. Um, so there's there's more about touch that you can learn at, at, at these sessions. We have tools and we have tests, and I'll show you one of the tests that we run back in Redmond, where we're working with partners to make just the touch sensor glass go a lot faster. Here, see, we pick this guy up for the camera. I'll give you the robotic finger. This is the robotic finger. That's a, it's a robot, it's a finger that's attached to a robot that goes and touches the glass in very specific places that we know about randomly and tracks motion. And this is a PC board that has a clock that's synchronized with the clock on the PC. Let me show you how it works. So go ahead and touch that to the screen. So this is my robot finger. Yeah. And what's going on is it's sampling it over 100 times a second. It runs for about 10 seconds. It collects a bunch of data knowing where we touched and knowing where the screen responded. And because it's testing the hardware, it takes all of the software variables out of the equation. And we get a bunch of log files and important data that our partners use to make better touch hardware. And that benefits everyone because touch is across such a wide range of systems. You have to be able to trust that it's good to write an app that uses it. Um, another place that you notice the, these displays in common, uh, they're widescreen, I mentioned that. We're working with display vendors on trying to make the best possible experience for Metro style apps on next generation displays. Now, the important thing to know is if a screen can run Windows 7, it can run Windows 8 desktop apps 100% of the time. So 100%, so it, all that compatibility, even down to 1024 by 600, all your desktop apps continue to run on, on Windows 8. Which was even below the system requirements. Was, yeah. But we run on it anyway. But what happens is if you go to 1024 by 768, you get Metro style apps. If you have at least 1366 pixels across, you can do that side by side app stuff that Julie was showing you. And if you have 1366 by 768, you get all of the Windows UI with no compromises. And that's independent of aspect ratio. Right. So we work on all, you know, 16 by 9, 16 by 10. As long as you have uh, 1024 by 768, Metro apps run. And as long as you have 1366 wide, then you can get the side-by-side -side snapping. Right, in any form or shape or size. So we talked a little bit about the touch sensor. There are some other sensors that Windows 8 both supports and exposes to developers. So this PC has a three-axis accelerometer, it's got a magnetometer, and it's got a gyro. And you need to use all three of those in combination to make an app that like responds like this. Let's see if you can 
It's just a very simple steering wheel turning app. Well, what's going on? That's exciting. Yeah. Well, I'll show you what's actually exciting about that app is that if you were to write code to try to combine the output from all three of those sensors yourself, you'd be time synchronizing the data and then doing like math. It's complicated, but we've got we've got a we've got a, a sensor fusion API, a single API that combines the output of all of those sensors to, to connect to those sensors and get the full orientation. It's three lines of code. That's Visual Studio, three lines of code. Again, 